everybody this is Abigail Ockwell here and I'm coming to you this week with another Wick and Chat. As you can see I've started a new project uh, the canvas that the kit I'm working on is from Sparkle Crafters. Sparkle Crafters no longer exist but uh, you'll be able to find this kit anywhere. It is a uh, Vincent van Gogh's or van Gogh's however you pronounce it starry night and i've been working on this for since sunday and yeah i've got quite a bit done um i know you can't see all of it but i'll try and show you the whole canvas when uh well all that i've done when i've finished this whip and chat uh, I am using uh, what they call Craftmates lockables containers. Uh, I've got the binder, so I will link those in the description below. Also, I will link a site that does do the uh, Vincent van Gogh Starry Night, which you'll be able to find basically anywhere. So I'm going to try things a little bit different this time. And I'm going to try not to answer tag questions. I'm just going to try and talk about my week. And if I get stuck, then I'll go for the tag questions. But I'm going to try not to. Oh, so uh, the pen that I'm using is another one from uh, Etsy from Bella's DP Pens. I think that's what it's called. Uh, there'll be a link in the description below if you're interested in getting one of these pens. Um, I don't think this particular one is available anymore, but there are plenty of other pens that you'll be able to get. Right, so how has my week been? In all fairness, my week has been fairly uneventful. I was cross-stitching all the way up until Sunday because I just, I just really didn't feel like diamond painting. I hope you enjoyed my little cross-stitch video. It was my first uh, attempt at doing a different craft. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so what have I done this week? I haven't really done a whole lot, but that's the thing with this uh, current pandemic. You can't really go out and do a whole load. Uh, the only thing that I've really done, apart from filming videos, editing videos, and then uploading them, is D&D. &D. So... My fiancé runs a D&D &D group. He thought it would be a really good idea because my mum has never played it. And neither has my friend PJ. So he thought it would be a really great idea for us all to play D&D. &D. So we're on our, I want to say it's our second or our third week like that oh you can't see completely what i'm doing there we go i hope that's better and uh we did our first boss fight last thursday uh we we were up against a uh minotaur and my character decrier she actually beat the minotaur <laughs> she uh She took the ball by the horns, as it were, and melted him into blocks of ice and froze him into blocks of ice. Yay! Gave me. So that was fun. Uh, my mum's character is a bard. <laughs> the first week, um, there was a riot going on in one of the towns. Well, in the main town city that's in the air that's in the uh region that we're in and to 
and the villagers, the villagers, the city folk were attacking a cart, a merchant's cart, and she, because we got Scots in our family, she decided that her musical instrument would be bagpipes. So uh, she got their attention by playing a long note on the bagpipes, which was very funny. <laughs> it certainly made everybody laugh, which was fun. And we had to... This uh, merchant was actually quite important. He's the person that sent us on our little mission. We've got to basically stop a, a band of uh, bandits, effectively. And my friend PJ is playing a really, really, really horrible ranger. I don't like him. He's also a tiefling, but he is a pain in the butt. His character, that is. Uh, we've also got a couple of friends that join us. They're not in our house. They're not in our house, don't worry. They, they, we're doing it on Discord. Yeah, Discord. And so, yeah, we've got uh, possibly three people joining us. One happens to be one of my uh, supervisors, well, one of mine and Josh's supervisors at work. The, we have a friend uh, called Jay who's also playing. He's also, he works at the same cinema that me and Josh work at. Along with, obviously, our supervisor, Savannah, who hopefully is going to be joining us this week. I hope she is anyway. Because she's played D, D before she um has actually played in the campaigns that josh has ran at work but that can be quite that can be quite fun to uh organize because obviously everyone is working so um if there are more if there were like more than i think it was two people working we wouldn't run a session a particular week but yeah that that's the fun with the uh, voters and stuff so yeah um anything else happened this week oh yes that was what happened this week um so as you know or if you're new and you don't know um my so i'm getting married get married in 2023 we decided because of the current pandemic that we would uh push the wedding back another year originally it was going to be 2022 but yeah uh we pushed it back because of uh, the lovely uh what's going on in the world at the moment uh so we've got the wedding reception booked So that's great. It's um, if you don't know, uh, our theme of the wedding is Lord of the Rings, and our reception is going to be in uh, Amberley Castle, which is going to be a really nice setting, and it will fit with the theme as well. Um, I've also uh, seen some of the wedding photos from there from previous weddings, and I have to say the scenery looks amazing so uh when this whole lovely pandemic's over well not when it's over but when we go i think he, yeah when we go into tier two that's when we'll be able to have a look around the castle so amberley castle was is um a hotel but originally it was the home for the bishops of Chichester, which is very fascinating because I actually went to the school, Bishop Luffer. 
and the first sort of changes as it were were brought about by uh ralph luffer who gave his name to obviously bishop luffer school and the last yeah the last bishop to ever live there was was uh robert Sh sherborne yeah robert sherborne who um gave his name to my house when i was at luffer i was in sherborne house so anybody watching this who went to Luffer and was in Sherborne House whoop go Sherborne and yeah I just found it so fascinating some of the history that's happened there so it was I'm trying to remember when it was what the, well the dates I know when it was but during the British Civil War when we decided to get rid of the monarchy basically that was a really daft idea um we no not we so during the so during the civil war oliver cromwell who later became the uh he effectively became a king in everything but the title king Uh, he actually lay siege to the castle and he took, I think it said about 20 foot off the wall. It might have been 20 metres, like, I can't remember, I have to Google it and look it up. But I, I believe it was like 20 foot off the wall, it was, it was quite high, it was, it was quite a lot. So, yeah, that's... That's the thing. Um, it was originally restored. This was before, this was in the Tudor times. It was restored by the Builder Duke of uh, the 15th Duke of Norfolk, who were the Howard family. Anyone who knows Tudor history will obviously know the name Howard as. He was a descendant of Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of Henry VIII, who um, lost her head. Poor girl. And he actually uh, restored the castle, well, part of it. And actually, yeah, no, he did restore the castle. So I'm getting confused. I'm trying to remember everything that I read yesterday. So, like I say, he re he restored the castle, and I. I think he sold it on the builder duke he uh i can't remember his name but i know he was a, a bastard son i think he was fitz he wasn't fitzgerald it was some, i i can't remember but i know he was a fitz if you see the name like fitzroy or fitzgerald as somebody's last name that usually means that they had s that somebody in their family was a mistress and had some child with either uh the king or a lord so fitzgerald is normally the last name of anyone who whose family had a fling with uh, the king and let's just say Henry VIII he had a lot of mistresses one of the most famous ones being Anne Boleyn who later became his second wife second queen of England well sec not the second ever queen of England but but his second wife and she lost her head but uh, one of the interesting things is that Catherine Howard and Anne Boleyn were actually cousins. Because in the uh, documents regarding Anne's trial, 
it says that her her sentence was read by her uncle the duke of norfolk don't ask me to repeat his name because i can't remember his name <laughs> it's probably robert or richard or might have even been henry i i don't know it, it, it it's something but no during the time that and actually even before catherine howard became henry's fifth wife the norfolks were in a lot of uh debt and a lot of financial troubles so i think so they kind of used poor catherine as a financial pawn and she was used by a lot of men poor girl the i was gonna say something oh yeah so I've actually played a version of Catherine Howard and it is in the Regina monologues not to be confused with the vagina monologues the Regina monologues and it's basically set it's a group of monologues and six women And it's basically six wives of Henry VIII in modern times. So if Henry was around today, what would he, how would uh, they tell their side of the story? Which I think is really interesting. So in the, in the play, he is a, wealthy hotel owner rather than king but yeah the Catherine Howard uh character Katie I so the reason I would I played her is because it was one that I did with Chai Players which is the players for anyone that doesn't know what Chai means uh, around here and yeah it's her story is so so harrowing it's the most upset it's probably one of the most upsetting of the monologues i would say especially her last one but also at first, it starts off, she starts off really cheery and they're quite light-hearted. And then it's when you get to the third one, that's when it really kind of starts to get quite dark. But yeah, if you ever get a chance, any actors out there, if you ever get the chance to perform the Regina monologues, do. And you'll see what I mean. Um, also, I may have to be taking a couple more breaks than normal. I have um, a history with a really bad knee. So I may be kind of stopping and starting quite a bit. But yeah, that is uh, the status on my wedding. And also a little bit of a backstory for you. Uh, I've also... One thing that I hope to do at some point is actually do some monologues on this channel. So, yeah, if you don't want to watch them, then that's fine. But it's just something that I want to do. It'll probably just be me sat in front of a camera performing the monologues but I haven't really kind of 
thought about it. Well, I kind of haven't really had much thought. It's just something that's been there in my mind, as it were, as something to do. And yeah, I think if I can get permission to do like the Regina monologues and do Katie's story, I certainly will write. Um, that's cool for lunch. So I will halt it here and I will be back in a little while. And we're back. Right. So over lunch, I've actually been in my room all the time because my lovely fiance just decided that I shouldn't come downstairs and he bought my lunch up for me. We had mozzarella sticks, which was really nice. And then my mum came up and we had a cup of tea together. So yeah, that was nice. But seeing as I was going on about British history, how about we talk a little bit about British history? That might be quite fun. Of course, if you're not into that kind of thing, then I'm sorry, but <laughs> this is my whip and jet. And I think that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on a, on a little uh, ride through British history. So where should we start? I think we should start with the Plantagenets. So, we had, um, I'm trying to remember when it started. This is another reason why I have a tablet on hand, is if I need to look something up, I actually can. So that's quite handy. That's the joys of technology now these days. When the internet was in its infancy, it could be a bit annoying, but you know. Um, right. Four of the plates. Ah, okay. So, oops. This without it being in the way. Okay, that will do. I can read it. So, as I said, we're going to start with the War of the Roses. Now, uh, England has had its fair share of civil wars. Of course, you've got the one that most people know about, um, the British Civil War which saw the end of the British monarchy and we decapitated uh, Charles I. But I'm going to take you back to kind of where, I wouldn't say things get interesting, but they do kind of start to see the change of Britain and start to shape it in to the way that we know it in a way. So first off you've got the War of the Roses and um, this was a series of battles for throughout the 15th century to gain control of the crown of England. And basically it all started because in a way I'd say they were rumours, but you know, Either way is, is possible. So 
I'm going to take you back a bit before um, the War of the Roses. The king at the time was Henry V. Anyone who knows Shakespeare will know that there is a Shakespeare play called Henry V, part one, two, and I think there's a third part as well. And so basically it all started with when the king, King Henry, went into like a really long sleep. So he probably had some kind of coma, but we don't know. Obviously something happened. And his wife, Margaret of Anjou, she was trying to control the kingdom while her husband was ill. And the Yorks, they, they had always, they had never liked Margaret because she was French. That was a big one. And as you know, Britain has a very, uh, how would I put it? Interesting history with the French. Definitely a very interesting history with the French. Most of the time, we haven't got along. But sometimes we do. And so we kind of have this very sort of frenemy relationship with France, I would say. We're not friends, but we're not enemies. And part of the issue was that when Henry was in this sleep, Margaret found out she was pregnant and she gave birth to a son called Henry and rumours immediately started to circulate that the king wasn't the father that it was Somerset the Duke of Somerset that was the father of their child of the child that Margaret was carrying and this kind of went on and of course because <clears throat> excuse me Henry <clears throat> excuse me geez and of course because Henry was in bed ill not really with it as it were and she was ruling the country now at that time uh course views to women have changed but during that time women were very much sort of they were just seen as reproduction vessels as it were and the fact that a woman was trying to rule country the lords and nobles didn't like that and especially the fact that she was taking advice from the duke of somerset which they didn't like so when henry kind of so there was all the, there were these battles that happened and this was kind of the start of the war of the roses if i believe so um Oh, and it started in 1455 and it raged on until 1487. So, yeah, that was a really long time. And I didn't say this. Um, it was between the Yorks, which were the White Rose. So you have the White Rose of York and the House of Lancaster, which were 
the um, Red Rose. And of course, eventually after the War of the Roses, they were combined and they made the Tudor Rose. But we'll get into that. So, uh, so I'm going to read this bit. The struggle ignited around social financial troubles following the 100 Years War. Fun fact about the 100 Years War. The 100 Years War was not actually 100 years long. It was, I believe it was... So, it was 116 years long, the 100 Years War. But you can't, um, obviously, 100 Years War sounds a lot better than the 116 Years War. Yeah, that doesn't exactly have the same ring to it. So, it's partly due to that and unfolding structural problems of bastard but, uh of bastard feudalism combined with the mental combined with the mental infirmity and weak rule of king henry the yeah it's henry the sixth sorry it's not henry the fifth it's henry the sixth but there is there is a play called henry the fifth and there's also a play called henry the sixth but... so that basically um started this that whole conflict and the Yorks kind of started to raise their heads Richard of York in particular he was like the main he was the father to the two uh, two four sons sorry four sons four sons there were four sons I'll have to look it up what um, his eldest son was called, but there was Edward, who would later become Edward the Fourth. Oh, Edmund. Edmund was his eldest son. Edmund. Edward the Fourth. Right. Okay. So, as I said, this revived um, the York's claims to the throne led by Richard of York, who was the father of the eldest son, Edmund, who was 17 at the time. He would later be killed in the Wars of the Roses. Also, um, his son, Edward, Edward of York, who would later become Edward the Fourth. And you, his brother, George, who would become George, Duke of Clarence. And then there was the youngest, who was Richard, who would later become Richard III. And so, yeah, this all started due to that, but... The Yorks, uh, there was also rumours concerning the Yorks. So I'll, I'll go into that because this will rear its ugly head later. There were rumours about Edward's birth. There was a rumour that his mother, Duchess Cecily, had slept with an archer and that that was actually Edward's father and that does become there were there were all sorts of things that happened surrounding that during his reign that would keep almost in a way rearing its head that was always something that I think he couldn't escape. Whether he was or not, we don't know. So, um, so the way the whole... There we go. So, during, um, 
during the 1450s um so obviously this was when the whole thing of the king's mental state started to almost this is when the started to happen and when he kind of went into this sleep we're not actually sure whether it was a sleep or whether he just had a mental breakdown or what but the 1450s was centered on the king's uh, mental state and also the inability to produce an heir with Margaret of Anjou. And because there hadn't been an heir of yet, uh, there were two, two branches of the of noblemen people of sorry two noble families that kind of started to raise their heads because they were they were keeping note of um you know what was happening and also uh they were close to the king and so if for example henry died without issue that means if he died without an heir, the country would be flung into turmoil and nobody knew what would happen. And nobody knew, sorry, who would rule England after he died without an heir, if he died without an heir. Which I have to say, at this point, it did look fairly likely he was going to and so they say there were two families that uh that raised their their heads and were saying we have claims so the first one was obviously the york family which was edmund nope that's not sorry richard of york and then the second family, the second family, this is interesting, were cousins of the king himself, the Beaufort family. Now, some of you may be familiar with the name Beaufort, and especially somebody called Margaret Beaufort. So the Beaufort's claim is, I have to say, it's a very, very loose one. Because their claim directed from a distant cousin that had had a fling, that had had a bastard child with, which king was it? I want to say it was Henry II, but I'm not sure. And that was their claim. And they they had, they basically said, yeah, when the king dies, we will be we will be the ru rulers. And that was what Edmund Edmund uh, Tudor, the second Duke of uh, Somerset, said. And there was kind of all this stuff that was going back and forward and and uh, Edmund was saying no no we're going to be we're going to be, be uh, the ruling family the, the king has promised us that if if he dies without an heir that he will pass the throne on to us and so this obviously started to uh bubble up a little bit and I think as you can tell uh the Yorks and the Beaufort families did not like each other. So, this was all going on, and then in 1453, the news came that Margaret was pregnant, but... Henry was descending into increased mental instability and by August he was coming completely non-responsive and 
and unable to govern, which is where the rumours come in to who the father of Margaret's child was. And of course, as I said, he had a favourite, the Duke of Somerset, who uh, was rumoured to be the father and not the king. Now, this wasn't, now, adultery wasn't a crime yet. As in, well, it was a crime, but it wasn't punishable by death. That happened in the Tudor era, and we'll go into that probably next whip and chat. So, um, a whole, all the noble families were gathered together and they became the Great Council. And they tried to kind of go through all the political mechanics. And Richard of York, during all of this, Richard of York declared himself Lord Protector. Oh dear. First shot wave. And chief regent. And he was also calling himself chief regent during the mental incapacity of the king. And Margaret gave birth to a son, which was Edmund of Westminster. Edward, sorry, of Westminster. He died in the later Wars of the Roses, but we'll We'll probably get into that later. We probably won't even get into that this episode. We'll probably get onto that <laughs> next week, if I'm still here. <laughs> no, no. I hopefully I'll still be here, but I'm very waffly, as you're aware. And I say, um, ah, uh, where's this bit? <laughs> Ooh, dropping my pen. That's not good. Sorry about that. Any headphone users? Or any earphone users? Whatever you're using to listen to this. And so, so in 1555, uh, for, sorry, were 1455 even, Henry started to regain his functionalities and then the first battle happened at St Albans, which quite a few of the Lancastrians, they died at the hands of the York. And Henry was imprisoned and Richard of York uh, resumed his role as Lord Protector. But uh, the peace didn't last long and the Lancasters were inspired by... Margaret of Anjou to contest the York's uh, influence. And so in 1459, war resumed. And as a result, Edward of York, sorry, Richard of York, sorry, I'm getting confused with Edmund Beaufort. Edward of York was forced to leave the country and he fred, he fred he fled even to yet yeah, france right i'm gonna take a break because my knee is getting quite sore so we'll come back to this in a minute there we go we're back okay so as i said richard of york he fled the country and now that henry uh was restored to power York's most prominent supporter and a very important man in history, uh, the Earl of Warwick. He uh, invaded Calais in the October of 1460. And in and the Battle of Northampton, Henry uh, was captured and York actually returned to the country for the third time as uh, protector of England 
but but was disputed but was dissuaded from claiming the throne though it was agreed that he would become heir to the throne so you can see all those little rumors and all those little whispers have uh, kind of got them somewhere so by naming york and all his by naming all by naming Orc, by naming York the next king, that would mean all of his heirs would inherit, and which would mean that his eldest son would inherit the crown after him, because that was how it how it worked. If uh, you had a male heir, then you would obviously give it to the eldest women they didn't matter so much they were just married off so if they were the heir to their father's land then they would marry them off to a rich landowner and he would become the heir the joys the joys of uh, women in medieval times so after all that that happened um and we should probably so yeah basically um after all this was agreed margaret moved her son up to the north of england to gather support so she was effectively now trying to rule england now that her husband was in the tower of london very bloody history at the tower and she knew or she felt that she had to do something she was not going to lose lose the crown that she loved so much or have her son her only child be uh have his birthright as it were taken away from him So I catch on again. I think I might be. Uh oh, one minute. Oh, hello, Miss Pete. Can you come to join us? <laughs> no, Missy's now in the room. She's just gone onto the bed as I thought she would. Oh, um, if you heard that beeping, that would have been my dad's Stella. So, oh. hello, do you want to pop up? I will continue with the story. So, yes, so in December of 1460, the Battle of Wakefield was, was fought, and this was obviously up north, and Margaret of Anjou, uh, she obviously had a stronghold in the north. They were loyal to her and the Lancastrian throne. And what happened when the York, the Yorkist army went up north? It was it was effectively a, a bloodbath. So Richard of York and his eldest son Edmund were both killed at the Battle of Wakefield and then um, the Lancastrian army they uh, they advanced to London 
and they freed the king. They, were, they freed Henry from the tower. And now uh, Edward. Oh God, she's not going to want to go out, is she? Edward, uh, the second son that I said had had all the rumours about his birth was now uh, head of the family. So now when Henry died, he would be king. Um, so in, yeah, so this is, um, I'll come to the end of the uh, War of the Roses on the, um, so I'll come to the end of that, so as I've said, um, so, uh, Ed, um, so, so Richard's eldest son, Edward, uh, he was proclaimed, uh, oh, sorry, um, so after the Lancastrian army, they won the second battle of St Albans. Yes, there were two battles. They then went to London, but they failed to occupy it. So they had to retreat north. And as I said, uh, Richard's eldest son, Edward, well, now his eldest son, seeing as his eldest brother had been killed. Um was now proclaimed the king he became king after that battle and one of the final blows to henry the sixth happened in march 1461 at the battle of towton where the yorks basically massacred and defeated the uh, Lancastrian armies. That was one of the most bloodiest battles in British history because Edward slaughtered excuse me, slaughtered half of the nobility, half of the uh, noble, the, the uh, nobility, like the noble sons and fathers of England. So that kind of made things a little bit awkward. Of course, she wants to go. Seriously, Chris, please. Right, think of your mind. Right, bye. So she scratches at the door again. I'm not at that. Oh. Ouch. Yikes. Of course she's scratching at the door. Well, I am not getting up again. She can just stay out there. Now, um, as I said, he sorted half of the nobles in England and this was kind of around this time where he met his wife Elizabeth Woodville and if you've seen the White Queen or read the book The White Queen that is all about That is all about uh, her, her story as queen. It's a very interesting read, actually. Um, it's by Philippa Gre Gregory, the White Queen. And she was also uh, the mother of the princes in the tower, which we will probably get on to in the next whip and chat if you're interested in this so um next i will next we can open chat i will uh try and get into edward king edward the fourth and 
yeah, hopefully everything will, will, uh, la 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 la. I think Josh is streaming. That's why I'm hearing his voice through the floorboards. <laughs> right, so that's all I've got time for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this whip and chat. Um, please let me know if you did. Um, and we will continue this. Oh, yes, I needed to show you the rest of um, the image. Oh, this is painful. Oh, um, there we go. Um, we're just going to use the mess of the desk. Oh, my. Figure it. Okay, I'm going to have to take this off the stand. I'm just going to do that. So that's what I've got so far. As you can see, it starts to get the swirls here. And then you've got this lovely bit here. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you did, please like, comment and subscribe. Please leave comments in the uh, comment section below. I always love to read them. All of them have been really nice so far. And I've now got over 50 uh, viewers on my first ever whip and chat. So... I'm obviously doing something right. But yeah, I um, hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next week. Bye! Bye.